So my name is Keith Basil. I am on the uh, one of 10 product managers on the OpenStack platform product management team, and I cover security. And with me is Nathan Kinder. Yep, I'm the uh, engineering manager for security in OpenStack. So we're going to run through the uh, most recent roadmap for security. So a little bit about us. Um, I do a lot of dirt biking off-road. I try to hit every spot where I go traveling. So I've been to Australia, Cyprus, uh, Barcelona riding, and I race in my home state of Virginia. Back home, and I'm building a car. <laughs> so, uh, and Nathan? Uh, yeah, and I'm, uh, I, my kids race, and I'm <laughs> sort of mechanic, crew chief, etc. for all of that, um, in addition to just outdoor stuff and messing with anything I get my hands on. So. And it's weird because we did not know about each other's car <laughs> interests until, what, probably nine months ago. Yeah. Well, if you came to this session last year, we had two-wheeled things yeah, it was up. A two so this, wheel, this it was year, this year, dirt bike and me on a, on yep. a mountain bike. But now we, we switched over to Next year, we need to ride unicycles or something. Yeah, something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, so I'm going to talk about our strategy when it comes to security, and then we'll get into the details of the technical features that we're releasing for, that we did for 12, and then we're doing for 13, and what we see going in the future. So the big problem we have with OpenStack is that it's worldwide in nature. Our deployments are here in the US, they're in Australia, they're in Asia, they're in EMEA. And what's happening to us is that when you drop in OpenStack into a critical infrastructure environment, let's say a telco environment in the country of France, there are governing bodies that dictate how the security of that stack needs to operate. And you need to get what's called an authority to operate typically in, in a given industry. So as a product manager, I'm tracking these risk management frameworks all over the world. And then I'm combining that with the crazy speed and life cycle of OpenStack. So the, every six months, there's a new version. So I've, I've got to build, or our team has built kind of this um, approach where we call it compliance-driven approach to security. Because the other problem that I needed to solve as a product manager is when these questions come in, how are you doing encryption? What's your TLS stance? Um, do you support a hardware security module behind barbecue? I mean, there are a lot of things come in. And by having a compliance-driven approach, it gave us structure to address the security. So when these features come in, I can now allocate them to encryption and key management as a set of control groups, right? And then that allows us, allows me to work with Nathan and the engineering team to prioritize what we see in the marketplace. So looking at this screen, there's a few things here. So I just described the compliance-driven approach quickly. Um, we, as a team, we've mapped out uh, using the Cloud Security Alliance uh, set of controls, and I'll show you that on the next screen. Um, as our kind of home base, because what these guys have done is something really cool. They've taken, they've created a meta set and they've mapped it into all the different risk management frameworks. So for example, if you want to know how you do encryption and key management, you can define it here at the, at the CSA level and then you can see how that maps into ISO as a framework, FedRAMP as a frame, framework, HIPAA, uh, PCI DSS, et cetera. So it, it gives us kind of like the Rosetta Stone of security and compliance, which is great. So of those groups, we're focusing on the top four that you see there. Infrastructure and vert, encryption and key management, identity, and threat and vulnerability management. And then, so that's kind of like the technical focus. And then on the right there, you'll see the business and strategic focus. So we look at FedRAMP, which is kind of the gold standard in the US public sector for uh, compliance. And what we found through our research is that if you can solve for, let's say, FedRAMP moderate, which is the medium level there, you're going to get like 90% of everybody else worldwide by default out of the box, okay? So that covers what I consider public sector uh, and financial services and just kind of general, uh, you know, IT level uh, compliance. The other two are interesting because you've got ANSI, A-N-S-S-I, which is a French government, as I alluded to earlier, that has to grant an authority to anything that's tagged as critical infrastructure. So we're, we're you know, moving into the telco space and the largest telecoms in France they're talking to me because they say, look, we have to get this authorization. We need this security feature, this security feature, this security feature before we're granted the ability to do business as a telecom operator on top of OpenStack. So the other one is Etsy. That's kind of a guide to how do you lock down um, uh, security using OpenStack for the NV telco space. So those are business strategic initiatives that we have to pay attention to. And then, like I said, FedRAMP gets us everything else out of the box. So that's kind of our combined strategy. So I mentioned the control group mapping. So what you see here is the actual Cloud Security Alliance set of controls. Um, these are the ones that we kind of pay attention to as Red Hat. As a software company, 
these matter. There are other control groups that are not in our scope. For example, if FedRAMP requires people to have a background check, the personnel controls, so they got to be background checked, they got to be vetted before they even touch the keyboard. That's not a Red Hat problem. Yeah, physical okay. access. The physical, yeah. yeah, the data center. I mean, some with, you know, up to aisle six, you've got guys with machine guns at the, at the door, right? That's, that's not a Red Hat problem, right? So these on, that you see on the screen are things that we're tracking as a security group inside Red Hat. So this is a bit of an eye chart. This is what we call the famous tie flute roadmap model. Going from left to right represents time. I talked about the control groups. So what I did structurally is I, I labeled each horizontal bar I mapped that to a control group. The reason we did that is because we use this to map epics in terms of feature development. So if you, if you think Agile, you know what an epic is. You've got a, feature, a set of features that may take multiple releases to deliver. This is the same model, OK? So infrastructure inverts at the top. So you can see you know, going from left to right represents time. It also, in terms of color, represents maturity uh, in terms of meeting most of the controls in that control group. Okay, so you can see at OSP 12, there was TLS coverage. We released the first version of the OpenStack Security Guide. Um, 13 is where we have the Barbican uh, service released, which gives us uh, great support in terms of encryption and it unblocks a lot of uh, user stories. So volume encryption is now available, the glance image signing, and then object encryption for the storage side is, is there based on Barbican. So a lot of cool things there. We're going to dive into that a little bit further in more detail. Uh, and then standard things like the infra invert hardening, those are getting better and better. So you can see that getting more mature as we go from left to right. So it's always continuous. Uh, this thing will be updated. Uh, and you can see in 14, we're looking at some really cool things. Like we're releasing Barbican in OSP 13. But uh, between 13 and 14, we're working with a company called Talus. And they make a hardware, uh, what's called an HSM, a hardware security module, um, that we can plug into Barbican. And we're working with those guys very closely to, to get that as a point release for 13. So there's a lot of other things there. We're going to go into this in more detail, so I don't want to spend too much time here. But this is the overall security roadmap, and I'm happy to share this with anybody who wants to see it afterwards, OK? So let's go into a deeper dive. Uh, I'll kick this off, and then I'll hand it off to Nathan to walk through some of the slides. So control group is EKM, encryption and key management. So everything here is going to be related to encryption and key management, trying to make that bar more mature over time. The features we're going to discuss here are the current status of uh, TLS internally for all the internal services, NovaJoin, Barbican, and IPsec. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Nathan. Sure. So yeah, area of TLS has been something we've been working on for a long time in OpenStack. Um, so in earlier OpenStack releases prior to 12, we had support within Director to be able to deploy TLS for the public endpoints that your end users of the cloud are going to use. Um, this sort of scenario is what we often would call the hard outer shell with the soft GUI center. If you got on the network internally, uh, you weren't protected. You know, anyone could get whatever. Tokens are going over the wire everywhere. So we've been focused on hardening that part to meet compliance targets. So as of 12, you can now have director automatically configure TLS for pretty much all the internal traffic. Um, so you know, adds encryption and flight for all sorts of things, all of the different OpenStack services, Nova having to talk to Cinder, you know, all of that stuff's protected access to the database, which all the services pretty much end up using the database underneath it. Um, message queue, you know, so that's all protected as well. And all the HA components and the VIPs and everything that's involved in a director deployment. Um, big challenge in this is that it introduces certificate management issues. There are a lot of services, there are a lot of certificates that need to be issued to things. Uh, if you're trying to do things the proper way and not just use like a single wildcard cert for everything, which is bad, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's tricky. So we focused on doing this in a way that it can all happen automatically, and we can provision the certs from a real PKI. Um, and we do that via IDM, and I'll talk about how that works. Uh, so just so you can get a little bit of an idea of the, the status of things, so this really, you know, indicates what versions we actually had TLS coverage for all of these services. There are other ones that are in progress. Not everything's done. It's a continuous thing. Um, new services are always being added to OpenStack, and so you know we have to go through those and add support for them because TLS is at the application level. And now my clicker's dead. <laughs> yep. Okay, so now we're going to talk about NovaJoin and IDM and how that all happens. So is anyone here familiar with IDM, or do you run IDM? OK, 
Okay, we have a few. Um, so IDM is basically a feature set within RHEL. I'm not going to cover the whole thing. Think of it like a domain controller for Linux, Unix environments. What we're really using here is uh, it includes a certificate authority that is often used to issue TLS certificates. Um, so for IDM to be able to issue TLS certificates, you need to enroll a system as a client of IDM. Um, and this is typically done by an administrator that's provisioning a machine. They have to type in their administrator password. They have authorization to enroll systems. It gets enrolled. Machine identity is established. And at that point, you can pretty easily and automatically request certificates for services. Um, the way director works, we start with bare metal. Everything just gets deployed from there. There is no chance for the administrator to do things in between setting up the services. Uh, and that's where NovaJoin comes in, is basically an agent that can handle machine enrollment for you when Ironic provisions machines. So what NovaJoin handles is it gets notified by Nova that something's about to be you know, created. Uh, it can register the system with IDM, get a one-time password used for enrollment, transmit that securely to the system via cloud init, actually fire off the enrollment. So from the very beginning, the system's already IDM enrolled. Then the rest of the director can come along and you know, use Puppet, you know, have Heat basically do everything where it actually requests the certs and establishes those and configures the services. So, um, so the NovaJoin service right now, we use it on the undercloud system to do all of this. And that's all the things I just talked about that it basically does. We'll show some diagrams of how that works next. So NovaJoin deployed on the undercloud system. Um, one of the requirements here is you have an IDM system already in your environment. Director does not deploy IDM. Um, so you set that up. It's in your environment. The Nova join, the system Nova join is on, the undercloud system must be enrolled in IDM because it needs to actually talk to it and have established credentials there. So once you do that and you actually fire off your deployment, um, Nova join is going to get triggered from Nova's vendor metadata plugin. So it makes a call out to Nova join. Nova join gets some information about, hey, this is, you know, this is getting created. Here's the project. Here's the info about the host. And it goes and registers it and gets the OTP. And it shoves that back down through cloud init to the node. In this case, it's bare metal and ironic, but this would function with Nova in a typical case with VMs as well. Um, at that point, the IPA client install fires off with the OTP. It does the enrollment. Um, and go ahead and go to the next slide. And at that point, machine credentials are established with the KDC that's there within IDM. And then we can use it for all the cert enrollment afterwards. So we're using it for certs, but you just sort of get all the rest of the IDM benefits automatically from that because the systems are enrolled. So now your controller nodes, your compute nodes, you actually have centralized Kerberos single sign-on to those systems. You have host space access control that you can use. Um, you can control sudo policies. All the typical things IDM does for any RHEL system, you just sort of get automatically. Um, that can be tied in with your Active Directory for authentication for system auth. So a lot of nice additional benefits. Uh, one of the ideas that we've been toying around with internally um, is, you know, NovaJoin was designed just to work with Nova in general. It's not Ironic specific. So in theory, something we could do in the future is have NovaJoin as a service within the overcloud so that tenant workloads can automatically join to an IDM system to get SSO, so you could easily get certs for whatever your cloud workloads are. Um, so if that's a case that's interesting, you know, to you guys, we would be curious to hear about it as well as we sort of, you know, gather things for future roadmap. All right, so next we're going to talk about the Barbican service. Uh, Barbican is going to be fully supported as of OSP 13. So Barbican is basically a key management service for OpenStack. Um, it, while it is kind of a general purpose key management service, you should think about it as um, really only applying to the OpenStack case because it uses Keystone for authentication. So you know, your cloud workloads, if they want to stash passwords there or something and get them back or key materials so they're not embedded in the image or anything like that that you shouldn't be doing, you can do that and just use it as a general purpose thing. Um, so it's basic storage and retrieval of key material. It can do generation. You can associate additional metadata with those keys. If, you know, whatever you're using them for, maybe there's some additional data that you want to be able to fetch along with them. Um, and you can set access control for who can get at those keys at a fine-grained level if you want to. Um, the back end for Barbican is pluggable. 
So as of OSP 13, what we're supporting is called the Simple Crypto Backend. It's basically uh, a database that, you know, everything's encrypted in it with a, a, um, an encryption key, you know, a data encryption key, basically, that's there. Um, that key is just on disk, you know, that's not great. That's why uh, we want to look at the PKCS 11 backend, and that's what we're working on right now, so that you can actually take that key encryption key, put that in an HSM, have all the crypto operations take place there instead. Um, but simple crypto will probably meet the needs for, for some people as an initial start. So what's most interesting with Barbican, besides the general purpose case, is the integration with other OpenStack services, which it's most commonly going to be used with. And we'll go through the flows for each of those. But it's basically doing encrypted volumes with Cinder, doing encrypted object storage with Swift, and being able to do image signing and validation with Glance and Nova. So we'll show how encrypted volumes works here. So basically, um, you know, your, your regular end user comes along and they ask for an encrypted volume to be created at the Cinder level. And Cinder, when you do that, you can specify that you want it to be encrypted in this Lux. Um, Before you go, there's one step that's missing from this, and that's where the ops person, the deployer, would create the Cinder volume type of Lux. Yeah. Um, so that's where, that basically puts it on the menu for the tenants to consume at that point. So that, that's not shown here, but that is the yep. case. Yeah, this is assuming that that's there already. Um, so Cinder will then, at that point, automatically detect the type, and it will request a key to be created for that volume within Barbican. It deals with the generation and basically uh, generates the key, does a wrapping with that, um, that key encryption key, and stores it within its database. This is assuming the simple crypto backend. And at that point, yeah, this is, there we go. Um, at that point, basically, the reference to the key is returned, not the actual key itself. Um, and that gets stored within the volume metadata within Cinder. So at a later point, when you go and actually want to have the volume attached to Nova, Nova's going to talk to Cinder. It gets the volume metadata just like it usually does and sees, ah, this is encrypted. Um, and part of that is the reference. So within that, reference there, it goes to Barbican and it actually asks for it. It's using the token that it got from the user in the first place, so authorization happens there and it knows, okay, I should be able to get it then. And the uh, key is unwrapped, retrieved, and then it gets returned to Nova and the volume can then be mounted. One last thing that I'll say about this too is that when the user requests to create the volume, all of this, the key management, the key generation is done automatically. There's no other user intervention there. And at that point, too, you could go to the command line and do uh, a secrets list, and you'll see the automatically generated secrets for that tenant. Yeah, the tenant still has access to them because it owns the secret, so they can interact with Barbican directly at that point if they wanted to for some reason. So encrypted objects. Um, so we're going to cover the storage first, and then we'll, we'll talk about retrieval. So this works a bit differently with Swift. Um, basically, with the Cinder case, we talked about a key per volume, of course. Uh, the way that it's done with Swift is, you know, there's a central data encryption key that Swift uses for the whole deployment. So it's not, a, you know, object-specific keys or anything like that. So as a part of setting up the Swift proxy, uh, the administrator pre-creates a key using Barbican's REST APIs. Um, and they put that within the Swift proxy configuration to say, we're using Barbican, you know, here's, here's where the reference is to the key. So when the user comes along and wants to store an object and Swift has been configured correctly, um, it is going to go ahead and request that key using a reference from the config. Uh, this is assuming first, first access to Swift, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the key is retrieved, unwrapped, and returned back. Swift caches that because we're using one key over and over and over. We don't want to fetch it every single time. So it's cached, but it's never persisted on disk. And then it can use that to do object encryption and go ahead and store it within its object server. Um, retrieval, very similar as you'd expect. User asks to retrieve an object. If the key is not already cached, it would do the same sort of reference retrieval from its configuration, get the key back, and it can then do the decryption and return the object. So signed images. Um, Basically, it's going to involve Barbican and Glance. So we're going to separate out the image upload part. 
uh, first from the, from the actual Nova boot that you would do. So in this case, the user creates a key pair on their own first. Um, and so the, the user that's going to actually be responsible for uploading the images, they're the only ones that ever have the private key material. Private key material is never going to go anywhere else. Um, what they do is they upload the certificate to Barbican that's going to use to validate the images. Um, and so that gets wrapped in storage just like anything else that Barbican deals with. And you get a reference to that certificate. So at that point, this user wants to upload an image to Glance. They assign the image themselves. And then when they upload it, uh, you're able to specify the signature. And you're able to specify the reference to the certificate telling Glance that, hey, this is a signed image. And so that gets uploaded. Um, you know, the certificate does get retrieved. Glance actually does a validation at this point when it's getting uploaded to make sure it's correct and valid at that point in case anything got you know, man in the middle there. So it validates it. If everything's good, it gets stored. So later, when you're actually going to boot an instance, um, a user says, you know, boot this image, and it happens to be a signed image. The image gets retrieved, and the metadata indicates that it's signed and has a signature there. Um, so Nova, at that point, re retrieves the certificate using the reference that was also there along with the image and the metadata, gets the certificate back, and can validate the image before it boots. If it doesn't validate, it's not going to boot it, and it's going to throw an error back to the user. OK, so next up, uh, IPsec, also an encryption key management control group. So we talked about TLS before, and I briefly mentioned how it's at the application level, and it's a continuous thing where anytime a new service comes along, we have to make sure a developer didn't hard code HTTP instead of HTTPS upstream. We've run into that thing a lot in OpenStack. <laughs> um, so we looked at another way of getting transport um, encryption. And that's using IPsec within the control plane for internal traffic. So IPsec works at a lower, lower level. So basically, anything that's going to go through, you know, over a particular IP address pair is going to get encrypted. It doesn't matter what port it is. A brand new service can come along. Application doesn't need to know anything about it. And we just get encryption. Um, this is really attractive given, you know, all of the services in OpenStack. We don't have to configure TLS for every single one of them and hope that somebody int didn't introduce a bug. Um, and new things come along, and it just magically keeps working. So <laughs> this is the cleaned up diagram over the older diagram, but really just illustrating, you know, and a real deployment has more than this. <laughs> I think this is from the Kilo release uh, that this was created. You have all these things talking to each other, right? So think if you have to get certificates for everything and configure each one separately. It's a mess. So basically what we did is we created an Ansible role for configuring IPsec uh, in a director deployment. And so what this handles is actually handles the package installation. We're using the LibreSwan from RHEL, um, all the firewall configuration that's needed for that. We're using pre-shared keys right now. Certificates may be used in a future version. But we developed this trying to make it as something that could actually apply on existing OpenStack versions, even though that's something we don't claim support for. Um, and it handles all the actual tunnel configuration for everything. So networking is also obviously complex in OpenStack. We have real IPs uh, for things internally. Those are pretty easy for us to establish tunnels for. But we have other things like VIPs that get failed over. And we want IPsec on that as well. So if you're familiar with LibreSwan, um, there are different configurations. So you can basically have a node-to-node -node tunnel. Road Warrior is kind of the classic case where anybody that connects to this should be able to you know, get a tunnel established. So we use that for VIPs. Um, and then we have to handle HA. The VIP fails over, we have to shut down a tunnel, establish a new one. So all of that gets set up by the Ansible role. Um, this is also just to you know, point out the caveat, if you're familiar with Director and its network isolation environment file you can include, mm -hmm. this depends on you using network isolation. And in terms of productization, um we are talking to several vendors that make cards with IPsec offload. Um, there are some new features in Rail that we're exploring for a um, IPsec mesh, if you will, that increases the performance tremendously. So uh, we're still digging into this in terms of the productization, but it's something strong for us going forward. Yeah, and one of the things um, that sort of slowed us down on productization of this is we developed this using Ansible at a time where Ansible and integration with Director wasn't quite formed yet. Um, so 
today, even though this is not a supported thing, you could go out and grab this role, but you have to manually apply it after the director deployment takes place. Um, what we are keying off upstream right now and has already landed is director has a, a feature called config download, which is used for Ansible integration. And so we're able to rely on that where you can just include an environment file and have IPsec just set up from the director deployment. Um, and as I mentioned right now, it's just pre-shared keys. Uh, we might allow for certificates as an alternative in the future. Okay, so uh, new control group. I yes, uh, DimmyB <laughs> and access management. So um, this first feature focus is all about RBAC and policy of RBAC inside OpenStack. Um, if anybody here is a Telco customer, I apologize. Um, but we've been working upstream for like the last, what, six releases, maybe five. Probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, pol policy was a hot topic back in uh, Havana when I started getting involved. Yeah, so it, from so. Havana <laughs> version of OpenStack to recently the OpenStack uh, technical gathering in Dublin, um, we've been pushing to get some traction on getting uh, sane policy management in OpenStack. So we can talk about that and where we are. Uh, yeah. This is future. Um, so just as a product manager, I have to caveat that. That is the future, but we're working on that for uh, the OSP 14 release. Yeah, so with policy right now, there's really very, very little granularity or almost no granularity. Um, you know, there are really two common roles that you see by default. There's an admin role and a member role. Admin was supposed to be something where you can have an admin of a project um, due to, um, I'll call them bugs, I basically say it's design bugs. You have admin, you're admin for the cloud. So basically you have member of a project and you have the cloud admin. That's really it. Um, so adding roles is simple. It's just tell Keystone, hey, add this role, here's the name. It's useless without policy being changed. If you've ever cracked open a policy.json, it's, it's painful. It's really painful. Um, so you know, adding the policy for that, if you wanted to add like a reader role, which is the common thing that we hear requested, mm -hmm. good luck writing for the policy for it and testing it. Um, so that's really what we're working on is changing the defaults. There's a whole nether you know, effort to make policy easier to customize and to do, you know, more interesting things with if it doesn't meet your needs. But most people want more than just a regular member. They want a bit more granularity out of the box. Yeah, and I mentioned the, uh, yeah, so you, you called it out here. But on this slide, the thing that's pushing us from the strategic point of view is really our, our NFV and telco customers. Um, back to that critical infrastructure uh, being government specific, they are mandating that we have what's called lawful intercept capabilities within OpenStack. So, um, you know, somebody gets a search warrant to track cell phone usage through this platform, the LI role, the lawful intercept role can be used to, to do that. So the pressure on this is ridiculous from, uh, to, to get it right. This is why we've been pushing upstream so hard. Yeah. And then the monitoring is the other role yeah, for I mean, um, kind of read-only status to get, get a pulse on what, what, this, what the stack is doing. Yeah, right now, if you want to set up monitoring, you know, someone hijacks that, they can do whatever within the project. So it's, you know, not a good state. So what's being proposed right now um, upstream is to basically have three roles by default and have this span, the same methodology span all projects within OpenStack as a default standard. Um, the current names, names may change, everybody likes to bike shit over that, but uh, the current names they're looking at is auditor, which is basically your read-only access. And we're assuming project scope here, so you would have an auditor for an individual project. Uh, you would have a member, which basically indicates regular read-write access, but also to have an admin at the project scope level for any sort of additional calls which you deem might be a little, little much for your average member of things. Uh, maybe there are certain resource types that you don't want to allow anyone to, to create. You know, load balancers, I think, is one I've heard upstream where some, some people are, you know, want a separate group of people to manage the actual services for that. Um, and in addition, there's work to actually split out system scope from project scope. So you might want, um, you know, as a cloud operator, you might want to have an auditor that is not project specific that can just audit everything. Um, so you can basically multiply those times the two scopes. Um, endpoint management is, is, you know, the obvious example. There are things that do not belong to a project at all, um, but you may want read-only access to endpoints or something like that. So, um, Keystone has functionality already called implied roles, so this keys off that. 
So these all build on top of each other in the order that I've listed them. So member applies everything that auditor can do. That's how you get your read access to everything. Admin implies everything that member and auditor have, so they inherit. Okay, application credentials. Uh, this is another one that's mostly implemented upstream. Um, there's still a little bit of work that's getting wrapped up on it, but another common complaint around OpenStack is you often create like an RC file, especially if you're gonna do anything automatically and you embed your password into it. Um, if it's an OpenStack specific password, it's still not good, but okay, you know, it's protected. Usually it's like your LDAP password, right? So somebody gets that, they don't just have access to OpenStack, they have access to whatever else you can authenticate to within your enterprise. Um, so application credentials, it's actually a pretty simple feature uh, on the surface. It's basically the ability to create a separate credential that's only for OpenStack um, that you can then embed within your files instead of your regular user authentication. But you can go a bit further and start to strip down the access of what that credential can be used for or even set expiration if it's only to be used for a limited period of time. Um, so, you know, if you have, if you're an admin, for example, and you want something to run on your behalf, you don't need to create a separate user for it. You can create an application credential and say, this is gonna only have my, my auditor role once the, the roles are there for that. And they can't do administrative tasks at all. It can just be a monitoring thing that runs as you via your application credential. Um, and it allows you know, for things like rotation. You can create as many application credentials as you want, provide names to them for different usage, um, have a shared application credential, uh, create a second one that has the same permissions and rotate it when somebody leaves or shouldn't have access anymore. So it's pretty flexible in what you can do. Uh, it's also one thing to point out is it's restricted from very specific operations. So you can't like use an application credential to create another application credential or you know, do sensitive operations that you shouldn't be able to do against Keystone itself. Yeah, go ahead. It's so just as an example of, of what it looks like, um, basically you have an ID to identify the application credential itself, and then you have some sort of secret, um, just like a password is usually handled, the secret is not stored in clear text within Keystone, it's, it's hashed, so once you create a credential, you know, you get that back once, and don't lose it, otherwise you have to create another one. Um, so these two examples show not just two different, um, two different areas it might be used in, like RC files or a service account for Glance in this case, uh, but also you can use a friendly name instead of an ID if you want, if you have like a specific purpose you want to identify with an application credential. So we see that in the latter example where it says Glance cred instead of using an app cred ID. Okay, so IVS now. Yeah, so, so IVS is infrastructure and virtualization security. We've only uh, elected to highlight two issues here, two features. Um, there's quite a few. Uh, if you notice, this bar is kind of going from left to right. Uh, we have folks that are specifically working on like the lower level uh, hardening. Uh, so you'll see a lot of that uh, in the OpenStack security guide version 13. Um, I looked at that document before I came to Summit, the beta version of it, and it looks pretty good. Lots of good information in there. So um, if anybody is running OpenStack today, uh, make sure you get your hands on that document. Um, the intrusion detection, do you want to go over? I can talk about it. If you want to, go ahead. So um, the same team that's doing the infra, um, IVS work it has, doing, has introduced this feature called the AID. It's basically, I don't know if any of you are what I would call old head security guys here in the room, but uh, it's basically tripwire. Um, uh, for, for OpenStack where you can deploy this and it will basically check some your deployment. And if, there, if there's any diffs uh, due to a cron job, it will come and then give you an email on the diffs for, for that system. So pretty basic stuff there. But this will be uh, introduced later, fully supported um, as part of OSP. So uh, this shows some director integration. Um, so the overcloud nodes deployed with eight are enabled. Uh, the, the scanning, the fingerprinting is done. Uh, that gets stored in the database, and then we run the cron job and, and, and check the status of that and report that to the ops person uh, for, any, uh, for any diffs. So this is very similar, a um, little bit more detailed. Node contents are scanned, and then results are compared, and then the, the report is sent. So pretty basic. Um, you want to run through the configuration secrets? Sure. Okay. 
Yeah, this has also been another very long running discussion upstream um, that everybody acknowledges is a problem, but it's a little tougher to, to solve. Uh, if you look at any OpenStack configuration file, you're going to find all sorts of clear text secrets within them. You're going to find the service user passwords. You're going to find the database connection credentials, um, potentially credentials for talking to like Rabbit. Um, Barbican, I can use an example too. If you're using simple crypto in Barbican, that master key is stored right there within the configuration file. Uh, so <laughs> not, not very good the way things have been done there within OpenStack. Um, so basically what we are looking at doing is there is a library within OpenStack called oslo.config that handles all the configuration uh, file parsing and adding the ability for it to have externally sourced uh, configuration values. And so the most interesting one is the third one in this list, which is you know, call out to some sort of secret store like a Barbican or a Vault or something um, whenever that value is going to be read. So you're starting up Nova. It needs its, its service user password. It's going to have some sort of reference to a secret. It'll make a call out and get it from some secure location where it's hopefully encrypted on disk. Um, so right now, that work is being added to Oslo itself first, and this is sort of a multi-stage thing. Once Oslo has that capability, we have to look in director and actually deal with provisioning of those passwords. You know, all the passwords are generated at, at installation time and deployment time. We have to feed them into the vault systems first uh, and then tie it together. So right now, how the design is, is going, this is basically you know, what the flow would look like. Uh, passwords generated. Um, stored within the secret store, we're going to get a reference back to it or whatever that secret store uses. Um, the service would be deployed on the node and we would just feed down the reference value at that point. Um, and that ends up being what's stored in the config instead of the secret itself. Oops, sorry. No, that's fine. Yep. Uh, and so then when the service is actually started up, so in this case Keystone, it's going to read its config file. Uh, it's going to see whatever the format is. This is an external value and it will have some sort of registered vault that it knows to talk to. Um, and it will actually go and talk to that vault, retrieve the password, it's returned back, uh, and then it's going to go ahead and be used in this case for the database. No, is that password cached? That password is going to be in memory only. Whether it needs to be cached or not depends on the actual password. But okay. in most cases, yes, because you're sure. the Nova's the constantly talking yeah. to Keystone, right? It okay. has to get new tokens, for example. Um, that's it. Um, in, we're happy to take any questions. Yep. Um, I'm sorry, this is, you know, it's security. It's like nobody cares about security until you get compromised, right? So, um, but we are in the trenches trying to make it better. Um, be, there's a lot of what I call technical debt due to OpenStack, and we've just been chipping away at it every release. And uh, I think we were making really good progress here with the, mainly the release of Barbican uh, to unblock a lot of the encryption use cases.